So what I'm going to talk to you about today is a short history about um, American printmaking. Um, so American, the print revival boom was uh, seen um, in that was seen in the 60s, especially in Los Angeles. Uh, began in the 1930s because of the Depression. Um, in 1933, Franklin Roosevelt, when he became president, created agencies such as um, part of the New Deal. Um, to employ millions of people, of mostly unskilled workers, to build roads and public buildings. And part of this public works program, later called the, works, the Work Progress Administration, uh, WPA, um, there was a federal arts pro project that was for the visual arts um, that employed about 10,000 artists to create public artwork such as murals, paintings, sculpture, theater design, and arts and crafts. And there were about a hundred different community centers that opened to teach art and, to students and adults. And one of the divisions were for graphic arts that made publications, um, posters about social programs like to educate them on vaccines and the promotion of parks and uh, national parks and other spaces. Um, at the end of the Depression, there were about 6,000 posters created in Southern California alone. So here, uh, these were done around um, 1930s, uh, 1936, around then. So here is a, a poster promoting free classes about uh, different kinds of career or job choices. Um, here is a National Park Services poster promoting the Grand Canyon and the Yellowstone um, Park. Here's another one, a housing poster, and for a zoo. Here's another uh, about the health education uh, poster promoting nursing, and uh, another one to educate people about cancer treatments. So it kept many people alive during this extreme economic hardship and some artists that you might know, uh, like Jackson Pollock. Here's an etching um, that you know how to do. Our <clears throat> Intaglio, he's known for his paintings, his abstract expressionist paintings and action paintings. Another one um, is Millard Sheets, who was employed under the WPA. He's known for his mosaics, mosaic murals that you might recognize around uh, Los Angeles. So these mo uh, mosaics are on uh, or on bank buildings that you're, are still visible today. And here are some old photographs of, say, the Home Savings Bank on Wilshire in Santa Monica. Here's one on Wilshire in Beverly Hills. Um, so you might see them. So I'm showing you this so you might recognize his style and uh, why you might see a lot of this public, why you might see like a lot of the public artwork from this time period. Here's another one of Millard Sheets' um, mosaics in Riverside. These are like scenes of American uh, history or depicting uh, Californian scenes. Um, so since we're on Millard Sheets and Los Angeles, I wanted to show you this uh, one that Millard Sheets' son, Tony Sheets, created was a, is a bass relief of the evolution of Los Angeles, or evolution of Los Angeles. It's like a printmaking mural about a mural um, on Spring Sh Street between uh, Second and Third, it's the parking lot structure. It starts off with the First Amendment. Uh, it's about freedom of speech and of the press. I thought it was interesting. So if you might see it in Los Angeles if you're downtown. Um, so, but at this time, uh, printmaking print was still new and was gaining popularity because of the, all those educational posters and cultural propaganda. But like the graphic arts was still thought of as less valuable. But uh, when World War II began, uh, many Europeans fled to America, and this included many notable people. And New York became a meeting place for all these exiled European artists and American artists. Uh, one man who influenced American printmaking was Stanley William Hayter, British-born. He had um, 
a well-known atelier in Paris, which moved to New York in the 1940s. And Hayter had worked with Picasso and George Brock, who you might know. Um, and when he came to the U.S., he taught a course in the new school in New York. And it was so popular, he left the school and held it at his studio. So he worked with a lot of advanced students and professional artists from very, uh, very many different disciplines. And his approach was um, experimentation with material and pushing um, independent thinking. So some of um, the work that artists that he worked with in America was uh, uh, someone, uh, some people like Louis Bourgeois. Um, so this is of uh, his uh, work. So his work was very um, expressive. Uh, influenced by autom auto autonomism at the time and uh, work with color and um, sort of innovative te techniques that weren't done before. So um, Louis Bourgeois, remember her, um, her early work was done at the, his atelier. Here's Jean Miro, which you might recognize. So he was also someone who passed through his shop. And the one, uh, the print on the left is a dry point. Here's another one of uh, Jackson Pollock. Um, another dry point. And um, Max Ernst, you might know, known for his frittage or his uh, surrealist artwork or Dadaist. So uh, Dadaist and Surrealism was like a European avant-garde movement at the time, and this was rejecting logic and reason, and their art um, instead expressed uh, nonsense or of the unconscious. It was a reaction to World War I and their discontent with violence, war, and capitalist society. A lot of work you see at this time reflected that kind of sentiments and ideology. So in, um, in the U.S., haters techniques spread through colleges and art schools, and the spread of ideas opened up the medium to experimentation that had been associated with old masters such as uh, Albrecht Durer and Rembrandt. And these two were known for their innovation and craftsmanship, uh, especially pushing the technical aspect of art, such as perspective, proportion, and just the craft of printmaking. And these old masters illustrated scenes from the Bible, history, and their own observations. But again, um, early work from the 15th and 16th century were very different than this time in America where materials and experimentation worked well with the subject of the unconscious and, and self-expression. Um, but so in the night, late 50s and 60s after World War II, there was an economic boom, and the GIs came back from um, from the war. Many went to art school, and there was a lot of art activity at this time, and a number of influential printmaking studios opened. And the first significant one that opened was in New York, the L uh, U L A E, the Universal Limited Art Editions. In 1957, Tatiana Grossman, a Russian immigre who fled Europe in, to New York in 1943, had to support her family because her f a husband fell ill. And out of necessity, she had the idea of publishing illustrated books, but by chance encounters and an artist friend, uh, it was suggested to her that she focused on original prints rather than reproductions. And from one artist, she invited others and and she kept an eye out for at galleries for new ones. A few artists that investigated printmaking at the ULAE were Robert Rauschenberg. So he's a pop artist that was known for his assemblage collages with magazines. So you can see here in his prints, um, magazine uh, imagery collaged into a single litho lithographic print. Um, another one is Jasper Johns, also a pop artist, um, kind of known for his use of numbers, the American flag or the target. Um, here you can see um, some work that he did with the ULAE. 
and him working on a stone. Another one is uh, another pop artist, Jim Dine. Pop um, is like popular culture, so everyday objects he's known for uh, using. So you see here a clamp, you see toothbrushes. I mean, he's done other things, but these are some work that he did at the ULAE. Um, so these were three that were working on ideas of popular culture at the time and the ULAE allowed them to explore printmaking early in their careers and they continued on to use printmaking as part of their art practice. So on the west coast LA became an active center because uh, during the war LA supplied the military so uh, with factory jobs it grew and it became prosperous um, and economically as well as um, the educational institutions grew. So all, LA also had a wide open space, it was cheaper, and it was a place where artists can get away from New York. So um, printmaking in LA began with an artist, June Wayne, who was uh, very taken by the technique of lithography. She had went to Europe to learn from masters, um, master printmakers, and later she was awarded a grant to revive lithography and started the Tamarin Lithography Workshop in 1960. And it trained a lot of new, a new generation of uh, master lithograph lithographic printers who then later opened up their own shop or taught at schools. And she saw this medium as a way to allow artists to make affordable quality fine art prints. And the lithography before this was regarded as a throwaway posters rather than serious. Um, and Tamarin also brought many artists in and it changed the world of printmaking. So it ran from 1960 to 1970 until she let it go to focus on her own work. And it was moved to the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque as the Tamarin Institute. Um, so the revival of etching or intaglio printing uh, followed uh, with the Crown Point Press in San Francisco in 1962 by an artist, Kathan Brown. She made editions for artists speci specializing in etching, and then she later partnered with another shop to work on Japanese-style woodblock printing, which is different than what you're um, doing in this class. Japanese woodblock wood printing uses water. It's water-based. Um, so one artist that you might know is Chuck Close, and he's interesting because he has a disability where he can't recognize faces, a disorder called uh, prog prosopragnosia, where, his, where faces look upside down or misplaced. And so to get around this, he uses a grid format to create photorealistic paintings. And later, his grid is emphasized how you see it here now. So the one on the right is like a 113 color Japanese woodcut print, which took uh, 18 months to complete. Um, so you see here the grid that creates a um, um, portraiture. Uh, Wayne T-Bone, he's known for his uh, sort of luscious desserts and um, cityscape or really it's like the va it's a re regarding the vastness of American mobility um, I don't have it here but he's known for his uh, uh, sweets and desserts and actually the one on the right you see here is a woodcut I don't know how many colors that is but it looks like a painting right so it's done in a Japanese style um, but it's amazing. Uh, it, there's no clean lines, multiple colors that makes it look like a, almost like a, a watercolor or, or painting itself. Um, in 1965, uh, one of Tamarin's printers, Ken Tyler, left to start a partnership with two wealthy art collectors. Um, it's one of the most uh, renowned print shops um, it's known for its innovation and scale and um, adapt adapting industrial processes for contemporary fine art printing. So you see here um, 
This is Rauschenberg, which I showed you earlier with his collage work. And this was, at the time, or might still is, uh, still the largest hand-pulled lithograph. So it's a 72 by 35 inch life-size x-ray of himself. And you can see, like, originally it's a thousand dollars. And it sold an auction um, later on for $150,000. So you can see, um, if you were to make something this large, it's going to cost a lot of money. Um, so the difference between, I mean, it's sort of a, kind of a way to make them stand out and push the idea of printmaking to be monumental, basically. And so... Um, Anyway, Tyler, Ken Tyler had worked with many artists at Tamarin, and he brought over many contemporary artists. They ne he never they never told them what is not possible, so they're just pushing limits of the processes through the processes available. So they were also invited to stay for months at a time, and they developed a close relationship with the artists. And. Um, So you see here at Gemini another one that's very monumental. This is, uh, you know, Roy Lichtenstein, uh, also a pop artist. Um, these were gigantic. So they're kind of called wallpaper pieces because it filled up the whole wall space. Um, say, uh, I don't know, this one is uh, 102 by 152 inches. So it's really large. It fills up a, a whole wall space. Um, and that is a gigantic woodcut. And here's another one you might know of David Hockney, and here's a, a picture of him working on a stone and uh, artwork that's being printed right uh, off the press. And you can see presses are limited to a certain size, so printing a large sheet like like this or the next one is Ellsworth Kelly. It's um, almost 20 feet long. So it takes a space and it takes um, a plan to print these perfectly um, without smudges and I don't know. It takes a lot. Uh, these were just kind of um, a way to show off at the time. So um, what I think is interesting is technology. It's like um, printmaking and the idea of reproduction itself is is itself like a technical technological advance. But you know, materials change, uh, technology change, um, and the ideas change with technology too. So here, um, I mean. Um, what you saw at El Nopal Press was an obsolete press being used to make a contemporary work of art. So you remember the artist that was using makeup to print relief on a lithography machine? So it's very unusual. Um, and the artist used makeup about um, to talk about skin color or possibly beauty. But um, here you see that... Um, Like today, here, this artist here, Analia Saban, she uses laser cuts. So today there be, you could use, you could, there's shortcuts to make digital work look drawn. Uh, CNC machines, laser to cut stencils. Um, she uses laser cuts uh, to create this uh, mono prints here. So each one of these are... Um, unique and also different shops uh, this one was done at Mixographia and they make a mold to create molds of the paper so this is like a sculptural paper that was molded into this shape and then printed on um, so kind of breaking those boundaries of what is possible today 
I mean, uh, and, then, and depending on the artist's ideas, different materials can be used like food. So Ed Rische, um created this chocolate room in the 60s. Um, he also used vegetable dyes, but, you know, different food things like condiments, like ketchup or vegetable juices and here and chocolate. And here's some chewing tobacco as, as the color. Um, I mean, but all it takes are curious artists wanting to learn and understand the concept of reproduction. But, you know, today there's probably like 6,000 print shops, um, all with unique aspects, you know, uh, printing from, you know, blue chip artists that we talked about, like very well-known money makers to lowbrow. So publishing street artists and underground work. And so there's a couple of different shops and here in L.A. Uh, one is Modern Multiples and Serial Press, but there's a couple more that print street artists or print work for individuals like um, you, you or me who want something uh, done. So I, these are kind of interesting um, aspects to how printmaking has evolved from, you know, the from early, early on in the 20th century to today. So it's very different um, ways of approaching and ways of thinking. So printmaking and artwork that people make really reflect what is happening, what is happening at the current time. So you can see with work that developed in the 1920s on, it reflects like how um, and what things were going on at the time.